Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, let your blessings come this morning upon the ministry of your word and wonderful Holy Spirit move in our hearts, we pray, move in us more, Lord, as we are yielded and resting in your presence this morning. Oh God, we thank you. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. Hallelujah. You truly, Lord, are our shepherd. So, Lord, bless this time, I ask. I pray, Lord, that everyone would receive from you today in a special way. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are continuing with our series <clears throat> on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have covered the last few weeks in detail, and uh, we are doing expose on the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have finished the first two categories, the vocal gifts, that is the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. Uh, that's vocal because it involves speaking. We have also covered the revelation gifts, the world of knowledge in very detail we saw in the Bible, the various instances where Jesus operated and the apostles operated the word of knowledge. And I've shared some experiences with you about the word of knowledge, uh, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. Uh, we are supposed to do the third category of gifts, that's the power gifts, the gifts of healing, the gift of faith, and the working of miracles. Uh, but there is one more aspect about the word of knowledge I want to bring to you since we are touching on the gifts of the spirit. Uh, I would like to just uh, insert in here before I bring you the third category of the gifts of the spirit, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles and the gift of faith. Uh, want to share with you uh, area that is uh, very closely related. Sometimes Christians cannot differentiate uh, between the gifts of the word of knowledge that is genuine from the spirit of God and familiar spirits. So I want to talk to you and take one Sunday to speak to you about familiar spirits. Not a lot of teaching has uh, been done in the church and I don't remember doing this at all uh, in, in detail in this church. So familiar spirits, what are they and how are they different from the word of knowledge? Because they also predict the future. They are able to predict to some degree of accuracy certain things in a supernatural way. And what does the Bible teach us about this? kind of spirits or demons called familiar spirits. Whether you like it or not, uh, the reason for this teaching is you will be exposed to it because we are in the end time and we are facing a great spiritual warfare, an influx of demonic spirits and deceptive spirits that have come upon the face of the earth. There was a time when we had the New Age movement in the 1980s and the 1990s, and pastors warned their churches not to get involved. They warned their members not to go to those new age, <clears throat> new age meetings. And, uh, and uh, I remember very clearly in the 1990s, uh, 80s, when the new age movement was born, uh, at least in this country, uh, we were warned, pastors warned the church about the new age movement and their practices. That movement has grown over the last few decades and have to a certain extent infiltrated different places. It has infiltrated the corporate world. It has infiltrated politicians and parliament and even churches. And now we are in the year 2021 onwards, this new age teaching and familiar spirits 
have taken a Christian form and have invaded even churches today without us realizing. And you will see them in some places. So I want to bring a teaching and I pray that your heart will be open to see what God has to say and how can we differentiate between the prediction of familiar spirits and the operation of the word of knowledge. We saw Jesus operated very powerfully in the word of knowledge. For example, he revealed that the Samaritan woman had five husbands and the one that she is uh, leaving is not a husband. Jesus revealed by word of knowledge, you know, uh, that uh, 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 Lazarus has died, but this sickness is not unto death. He revealed very supernatural word of knowledge where he told Nathaniel, Nathaniel, before I came, you were under the fig tree. So, uh, and then we see how Peter uh, operated in the world of knowledge where Peter picked up from Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer Sorcer. wanted to pay money to have the gift of the Holy Spirit that whoever he lay hands will receive the Holy Spirit. But Simon, uh, Apostle Peter, picked up by the word of knowledge and told Simon the sorcerer, your heart is not right. You think that the gift of God can be purchased with money. And then Simon Peter revealed the kind of condition, the spiritual condition of Simon the, the sorcerer. He was in the gall of bitterness. He was living in iniquity. And so Apostle Peter asked Simon, repent and pray. Perhaps God will forgive you uh, the call of your heart. And so we see the word of knowledge is uh, uh, very accurate and uh, we see in the lives of Jesus and the word of wisdom, how Jesus picked up the word of wisdom. And he says, there's a coin in the fish. Go, Peter, pick up the fish and you have the money to pay the temple tax. And Jesus, by word of wisdom, predicted Judas will betray him. The temple will be destroyed. Not one stone will be left behind. That's an amazing prediction. He predicted that in AD 30 to 33. In AD 70, General Titus came into Jerusalem, captured Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple completely. So what was that? Jesus was operating in Matthew 24, uh, Luke 24. He was operating the word of wisdom. We say the word of wisdom is one fraction of God's wisdom that God chose to give to us. Yes. And the word of knowledge is one fraction only, just one word of God's knowledge. God supernaturally gave to us, which you cannot know in the normal way. And then it is for a divine purpose. So we see whether we have time in this session, we want to look at the differentiation between the true genuine word of knowledge and Christian um, uh, uh, prediction by familiar spirits. So what are familiar spirits? Let me begin, if you have your Bibles, i give you this introduction. A familiar spirit is a demonic spirit. Uh, in the old King James, it's called familiar spirits. In the new King James, for some reason, they translated it to become a medium, a medium that contacts the spirit world. So familiar spirits are a demonic spirit of divination. They operate quite closely, look like from the surface, the word of knowledge that are supernatural. Demons have supernatural knowledge too. And today, in many places, even in Christian churches, uh, I'm not surprised, I've seen it with my own eyes, the spirit of divination operating in some places, even through the pulpit especially in African nation, the whole continent of Africa. You see all this great, everyone seems to be a prophet in Africa. And they give amazing, astounding prediction to the very detail of the personal life of the person. It has been found that some of these pastors are involved in divination. They take and eat certain things, they wear certain things, they pray to some entities. And then on Sunday, they come to the church and they minister in the power. 
But that power is not the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the demon, demonic power operating in that ministry. It is happening today. And so we got to understand from God's word what are familiar spirits. So a demonic spirit, it is actually a demonic spirit that is called familiar, that is familiar with the lives of the individual. Let me say this. The Bible says we all have guardian angels. Yes, we have guardian angels. Everyone has been assigned a guardian angel. Jesus himself said it. He says, no, don't be rough with the children because their guardian angel always behold the face of my father. So all of us have been assigned a guardian angel. That our guardian angel watches over our life. He protects us. He preserves us from accident and from demonic attacks. And he writes a report of all our, all our life on earth in the great libraries of heaven, in the great books of heaven, where one day we will be judged or rewarded. That's the purpose of the guardian angel. And the moment we close our eyes in death, our guardian angel will be at our bedside, takes our spirit man, goes through the heavens in the first heaven, goes through the second heavens where the principalities and the powers and then to the throne room, to where God is. So the guardian angel has been assigned to us for life. Just as God has assigned a guardian angel for every Christian. Now listen to this. Demons have been assigned also to watch over your life. They study your habits. They study your character. They study your weaknesses that test your reaction to see which kind of sin you are more likely to sin, which kind of habits you are likely to do or practice. They know your weaknesses. So they are familiar spirits because they are familiar with some aspects of your life. Yes, just like guardian angels are familiar with how we live our life. We are not alone. We have someone watching us, our guardian angel. And demonic spirits have also been assigned to watch over us. If you are not a Christian, they want to bring you to hell. So that's their reward from Satan. But if you are a Christian, they watch us over you. The purpose is to devise a strategy, that strategy to cause you to stumble, to sin, and go away from God. That's the purpose of these demonic spirits that has been assigned by Satan that watches our lives. So the Bible talks about these demonic spirits and these familiar spirits. That's why they are able to be able to tell with some accuracy the details of your life. I'm sure from our culture, our Asian culture, I like the Western culture, but it's the same spirit, but they come in different package. Our Western, our Eastern culture, let's say in Malaysia and Asia, we have the temples, we have the mediums. Yes, I'm sure you have relatives or some of you were even in this uh, temple practice that will go and see a medium and uh, he, he or she will go into a trance. And there will be a familiar spirit. That spirit will come and uh, enter into the body of this medium. And they will speak like your deceased mother or your deceased uncle. They're able to mimic their voice as though your uncle has come back from the dead. And or your grandfather, whom you miss very much. There are some people who don't know the Lord. They go to the temple to inquire about the grandfather or their father, they have passed away. And the moment this familiar spirit enters the body of this medium, he enters into a trance, he's able to give some accurate detail about your life or his life. And this spirit will speak with the voice of your grandfather and uh, inquire about his favorite rocking chair. Or he will inquire about his favorite plant in the garden. And you'll be amazed how can this spirit, how can this must be my grandfather because there's no way the medium knows about 
my grandfather's rocking chair, or the favorite plant in the garden, etc. And so you are convinced that was your grandfather. That was your grandfather that has been summoned up to enter the body of that medium and speaking through that medium. We can understand that in our militia, in our Chinese culture, especially. You see, uh, in in <clears throat> in times of old, it's practiced in the temple. But today it has taken a modern form. Today he has taken in the New Age movement to the New Age movement and many other movements. And in the West, he has come to a very uh, modern setting. But it's the same kind of spirits that are present. Today they have gone more aggressive. They have not only have their own new age or uh, these uh, occultic uh, practices, but they have invaded the church. They have come in, into the churches to some place to some places, and it is the same. It is the same familiar spirits that are in operation. If you have your Bibles, I want to show you one difficult passage uh, to understand and try to explain to you. First uh, Samuel chapter 28. First Samuel chapter 28, reading from verse 6 to 19. It's a very sad story of the kings, a king called King Saul. It's a sad story because Saul was at a very desperate point in his life and Saul has been rejected by God. Saul was in a bad spiritual condition because the Bible says Saul exceeded his authority. Saul was in disobedience to God. He was not supposed to make the offering sacrifice. It was reserved for Samuel the prophet. Yes, I'm just giving you the background. It was meant for Samuel the prophet to come to offer the sacrifice. He was not called to be a prophet. He was called to be a king. But he was impatient when Samuel delayed. The Bible says Saul went ahead and burned those sacrifices. That's very serious. That shows to us the seriousness of worship. You cannot simply worship God any way you like and on your terms. When we come to God, we have to come to God on God's terms, not our terms. God has already said that Samuel the prophet will come and burn the sacrifice. King Saul is supposed to wait. But King Saul was impatient. He couldn't wait. When Samuel was delayed, he went ahead and did what he wanted to do. And God said he re rejected Saul. The kingdom of Saul will be taken away from him and will be given to David, will be given to King David. And so Saul was in this desperate situation where God was no longer with him and he couldn't hear the voice of God. And at this moment in this passage, I'm giving you the background. Israel is under attack. The Philistines have encircled around Israel. And Saul, the king, was desperate for an answer. So the Bible says in 1 Samuel 28, verse 6, I trust you are there. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. You see, when we pray to God and God don't seem to answer us, there are some things we must do. Uh, Saul did not learn that. Saul did not learn how because God did not answer him. He did not learn repentance. He did not learn to acknowledge that he was at fault. Never once did he acknowledge that he was at fault and cry to God for mercy. He did the wrong thing, but he just went ahead to live his life, to lead his kingdom. So when the Lord did not answer him by dreams or by Urim, Urim is one of those things uh, I won't touch on it in the Old Testament where the high priest will put on his chest. It's like a dice, you know, and then they will whether ask God and then it's like throwing a dice and the answer will be yes or no. And God did not answer him by the prophets. And so Saul wanted to know, to get an answer to a pressing issue in his life. He needed an answer whether he will win the battle. 
So instead of trusting God and fully let God do his work, he wanted an immediate answer. And the Bible says, Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium. This new King James, the old King James says, find me a woman who has a familiar spirit that I may go to inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who has a familiar spirit at Endor. She has been commonly called by Bible scholars, the witch of Endor. So Saul went to a witch, knowingly actually, because if you read the story, so Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes because he didn't want to be recognized as the king. He went and two men went with him in the night. They came to the woman and said to the woman, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman answered the king and said, look here, you know King Saul, what King Saul has done. She didn't know that was King Saul. You know what King Saul has done? He has cut off all the mediums, all the those with uh, familiar spirits and the spiritists from the land. You see what happened here earlier on when King Saul was walking right with God, he put away all the mediums and all the spiritists and all the wizards out of the land. He banned them and he punished anyone with death those who would practice this witchcraft. But now he himself cannot hear from God. He was desperate. He came to God. Uh, he came to this woman. So he says, I guarantee you no such punishment will come upon you. Saul swore to her by the Lord saying, as long as the Lord lives, no punishment will come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, listen very carefully. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring me up Samuel. You know why he wanted to bring up Samuel? Because Samuel was the prophet. Samuel has been his guiding voice. Samuel was the one giving guidance to King Saul in his kingdom, you see. So the women brought up Samuel. In this passage of scripture, there are two schools of thought. There are some who believe this is really Samuel. That he, she can bring Samuel up from the grave. There are those who believe this is not Samuel. This is something else and someone else. So let's read. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. She was shocked. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. Now see what King Saul said to her. What do you see? See, these spiritists, they have the ability to see. They have ability to see the spirit world. And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit. Underline that. Then old King James says, I saw a spirit. She didn't see Samuel, but it looked like Samuel. I saw a spirit coming from the earth, out of the earth. If you check the Greek word, that word a spirit is translated Elohim. It was a very powerful spirit like God. Elohim was the Hebrew word to use to describe gods, the gods of the earth, small g. It's not Jehovah. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, the gods of the earth is always translated Elohim. But when you come to Genesis chapter 2, when Adam made a covenant with God in the Garden of Eden, the Lord God, God changes, the word God changes to the Lord God, Jehovah. Jehovah is the God of Abraham, the Lord God. Whereas Elohim is simply a term to describe gods, small g, the gods of the earth. So the woman saw gods, a spirit, Elohim, coming out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? So see, Saul knows a bit about this. He knows that these spirits can take a form. What is his form? 
And she said, it's an old man coming up and he's covered with a mantle. So it looks like Samuel. And the Bible says in the New King James, Saul perceived that it was Samuel. But the Bible never called it Samuel. But it was, it was Saul who perceived that it was Samuel. And he stood his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? He was like speaking like Samuel, whoever this form was. And so Saul said, I, was, I am distressed for the Philistine make war against me. And God has left me. And God does not answer me anymore. And see what this Samuel said to Saul. So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has left you and has become your enemy? Saul rebelled against God. And that rebellion is like witchcraft, the Bible says. So this spirit that Elohim, that was not Samuel, came out of the earth. And this is what he said. He spoke some words of truth. And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord. Spirits that are uh, divin uh, divination spirits, sometimes they speak words of truth. So the spirit spoke to Samuel, uh, spoke to Saul. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord nor execute his wrath upon Amalek, the Lord has done this thing to you. And the Lord will deliver Israel to the hand of the Philistine. In other words, they will suffer defeat. And tomorrow, you and your sons will join me. So this spirit predicted the hastened death of King Saul. Tomorrow, Saul, you and your sons will be with me. And the Lord will deliver Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So I'll pause here this story. You can go uh, on your own to read about it. Why do we say, I will give you the second school of thought. Why do we believe that this form, like an old man with a mantle that looked like Samuel, is not really Samuel? Why it was not Samuel, the man of God, that came out from the earth and takes the form of Samuel. I'll give you a few propositions and you decide and you pray. Of course, there are two schools of thought. Some believes that it is Samuel. But even if it is Samuel, I want to show you an amazing verse in the Bible later that he died because he consulted this familiar spirit. Number one, we believe that this is not Samuel, the prophet that came out from the dead. Because the one who called him up is a witch. She's the witch of Endor. She is a practicing medium. A practicing medium has no power and authority to raise the dead. According to the teaching of scriptures, only the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has the ability to raise the dead from the last, on the last day. So this is one reason why we believe, or I personally believe, that this is not Samuel the prophet, but it was a familiar spirit that can take on different forms. Demonic spirits can take on the form of a man. They can take on the form of an angel. They can take on the form of a ball of light. I'll share more with you the new age practices. And they can take on the form of animals. And so, only the Holy Spirit has the authority and power to raise the dead. And so this witch of Endor raised up Samuel. She had a familiar spirit. It is a deceptive spirit, yes? And number two, Saul perceived that was Samuel. Now, Saul was already in a terrible state of mind. He cannot hear God anymore. He was under great stress. The whole kingdom will be attacked. And he needed an answer. And the answer was not coming because God has decided to take the kingdom from him and give it to David. And so he was in a desperate state of 
uh, poor, he, he, it's like I'm trying to describe, he's in a poor state of mind to be able to hear from God. And therefore, he forced himself to go to a medium of, that has a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit knows the life of Saul. A familiar spirit knows some of the weaknesses of King Saul because they have been assigned to watch over his life. The third reason why we believe that this is not Samuel the prophet or his spirit, because the original text says it was Elohim. Old King James says a spirit ascended out of the earth. It's a powerful spirit. When the woman saw it, he, she was shocked. Elohim. You don't use the word Elohim to describe Samuel. Samuel was not Elohim. Samuel was not like a God. Samuel was not like a God. Samuel was a human being. He was a prophet, no doubt. A man of God. He died. But the, but the, the woman saw Elohim. Some kind of Elohim. Some kind of God. A majestic one that rose up from the earth. Spirits come out from the earth and spirits come out from the ocean. And so on these few premises, we believe that this is not really Samuel the prophet. And let me now bring you to a verse that put to rest your you're taught that it's okay to communicate with the dead and it's nothing wrong. You can still have, there are some places that says you can communicate with the dead, even Christians. Some prophets claim, oh, Moses came to them. Some prophets claim that Elijah came and spoke to them and fellowship with them. And oh, it's so easy. Uh, a prophet Amos just walked into their room. Don't believe it. You see the teachings of Jesus. There is no communion with the dead. You never see it in the book of Acts and in the New Testament. The only account is reserved for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, where he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah appeared to him for a purpose. Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets, and this was the only one and only account in the whole New Testament. It is reserved for Jesus, the Son of God. There are some things that the Son of God experienced. You cannot claim you can experience. Say, how is that, Pastor? For example, when Jesus died on the cross, it was 12 o'clock afternoon, the whole sky became dark. You cannot claim because you are a great man of God, because you die, the sky can become dark. Is the sign to the world that you are a great man of God. That was the only sign reserved for the Son of God. And when Jesus died, the curtain was torn into two. You cannot claim that for yourself. It is a personal experience reserved for the Son of God. And so likewise, the appearance of Moses and Elijah to Jesus when he was on the mount. Other than that, you never find it in the writings of the whole New Testament. Yes? And so, these familiar spirits that uh, King Saul went to consult, displeased God so much. Not only he was in rebellion, his kingdom is going to be taken away from him, but it accelerated and hastened his death. That's why it's very serious for Christians to understand and discern the spirit of divination that is working in our time and in our age and even in the church world. Now, let me give you the scripture first. I'm just bringing you the teaching. It's up to you to do your own evaluation. You know, First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. Don't believe just what I say. Look at the scripture verse and see what I say. Is it based on the Bible? First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible talks about Saul's death. He died a terrible death. He fell onto a sword. He and his sons on the same day tomorrow. Tomorrow, 
after he consulted the familiar spirit, it hastened his death. Now Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord. What was the transgression? He disobeyed God by offering the sacrifice, even against the word of the Lord, which he has not kept. So that's why God says, I'll take away your kingdom and give it to David. And you see the last part, and he died not only because he did not keep the word of the Lord. The Bible says, and, and also for asking counsel. He went and asked for counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So there you have it. God is totally displeased and it is very serious. Uh, as far as King Saul was concerned, it accelerated his death and his sons the next day. I didn't say it. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13 says, those who went and seek counsel of those who had familiar spirit and to inquire a word from the familiar spirit, it totally displeased God. And it hastened, as far as uh, Saul was concerned, it hastened his death. God totally forbid the people of Israel in the times of old is the state is still the same God today. He forbid his people from having any contact whatsoever with familiar spirits because it's an utter abomination to God and it causes the death of King Saul in an accelerated and terrible manner. You know, there are two things here that cause his death. First Chronicles 10 13. He did not keep the word of the Lord. And he went and asked counsel from the one that had a familiar spirit to inquire from me. Number two, familiar spirits will defile your life. Say, so give me proof, Pastor. I'll give you the proof. That's why it's very serious. And we are at war in the spiritual realm in the last days. Satan is going all out to deceive. Familiar spirits defile you. Say, so how is that? Leviticus 19 verse 31. Leviticus 19, verse 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek the wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In the New King James, it's translated mediums, but in the Old King James, the original word, regard not those, in other words, pay no attention, have nothing to do, disassociate from people, walk away, they have familiar spirits, even though they may give you words so-called a prophecy that turn out to be true, but if you discern they are familiar spirits, walk away, lest something terrible happens. Number three, you see how God is so serious when the people of Israel went into the promised land, Leviticus 20 verse 6, Leviticus 20, verse 6. I'll just wait for a moment for you to get that. You must see this for yourself and be established in the truth so that you can guard against it in the future days ahead because it's coming. It's going to come in a greater way that you cannot discern. And the soul that turn after, you see, the soul means your emotion, your heart. The soul, when your soul and your heart turn towards those that have familiar spirits, and after wizards, you go warring after them. In other words, they are, they are a different spirit. They are not the spirit of God. So when you go after these spirits, it's like you prostitute yourself. You go warring after them. God says, I will set my face against that soul. God becomes your enemy. It's unthinkable when God becomes your enemy. Because God says, if you, if you turn your soul after such familiar spirits, you know, and you, you go after these wizards and sorcerers, it's like you prostituting yourself. God says, I will set my face against you. I will cut you off from my people. You will be cut off from the body of Christ. Uh, that was in the Old Testament, Leviticus 20, verse 6. And then you see God gives 
he handed down punishment for those who go after familiar spirits. A familiar spirit, I repeat, operate quite similar, but there are big differences, like the word of knowledge. They operate look like everything Satan copy, like the word of knowledge. It shall be put to death. Number four, a woman also, a man also, there's a familiar spirit that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. So in the Bible times, when there are these practitioners of familiar with familiar spirits, a good king will issue a decree like King Saul did in the early part of his life to put them out of the land, to stone them and kill them. Then you look at, I'll just give you one more verse. There are plenty of it in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 to 12. The thing that I tremble when I read that verse is that when we are in contact with familiar spirits, the Bible says you defile them, you defile yourselves. They shall not be found among you. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 12. There shall not be found among you anyone that make his son or his daughter to pass through fire. We see some religion today, even in our culture, is doing that every year. They make people walk through fire. They use divination. Observer of times uh, is astrology. <clears throat> people who read the stars. Astrology, the reading of the stars. The enchanter, the witch the charmer, and consulter with familiar spirits. This is the spirit of divination. And wizards. And necromancer. What is necromancer? Communication with the dead. But this is a deception because God says, these are utter abomination to the Lord. And because of this abomination, the Lord your God drive them out from before thee. Okay. So we see God is totally against his people defiling themselves, going after, letting their soul, going after the spirit of divination and familiar spirits and be not deceived because familiar spirits may know some detail of your life. You already know it in the temple worship. But today, people, the modern people, even in Malaysia today, the modern generation don't go to temple that much. Yes? More so, of course, you are, if you are Christian, you don't go at all. But even the modern generation doesn't go to temple that much. But the same familiar spirit have taken on a different form. One of the forms they've taken on is the New Age movement. And let me just give you some characteristics of this new age movement where uh, very likely you will see familiar spirits operating. If you hear any of such terms, nothing to do with it, walk away, plead the blood of Jesus, renounce it. Now, <clears throat> you may hear terms like meditation, even Christian meditation. Uh, there is terms that people now have come up with like... Uh, uh, deep meditation, which involves breathing, uh, yoga. Now, yoga has invaded even the corporate world because executives and politicians, uh, even in some parliament I read, they have a relaxation session. They invite yoga specialists to come into their office to teach their senior executives to relax, to breathe in a certain way, to sit in a certain position. And if they go deep into yoga, ultimately, they will release the power of the spine, which is the chakra. The chakra will release the power of the serpent, the kudalani spirit that will be released. So that's occultic and outright devilish, but it starts with just simple, innocent, deep breathing, sitting in a certain posture. If you hear People mention terms like crystals, crystal energy, have certain crystals you wear, they will bring healing to your body, healing properties, essential oil. Some of you go for spa, 
it's okay if you use some essential oil on your face. But new agents, this is one of their favorites, essential oils. Subliminal music. There's a certain kind of music now, even in some church organization in America, have introduced 24 hours subliminal music that helps you to relax, that helps you to sleep, takes your mind, you know, and um, it can open the door to the spirit world without you realizing. Light balls. This is a common one. New ages often see light balls, a ball of light. And they have a ball of light approaching them, and then it touches them, and it gives them a buzz in their body. They think it is God, but it's not. Many years ago, I heard a pastor who told me his testimony. He was praying deeply one day, and he said he, had, he saw a ball, a ball of light. The ball of light was just bouncing outside his window. It was just coming like this, like a mysterious ball of light. And then the ball of light wanted to approach him. Cut the story short, forward 25 years later, this pastor has committed adultery multiple times and is now teaching the doctrine of devils. He's teaching way out doctrine. He claimed to have Angel Gabriel. He, came, he claims to have Angel Michael. He claims to have the four great angels over the four great continents of the world appearing to him. And he claimed he'll be the first one that will not taste death. He will be like Enoch. Amazing, outstanding claims. So we see the fruit of some of these manifestations that come to people. And then we see their fruit in their lives of the 25 years. Uh, be very careful. I've noticed a few uh, individuals that have claimed to have seen balls of light, but it did not end well. Their lives did not end well. Another, so you hear terms like meditation, yoga, crystal, uh, essential oils, subliminal music. Another form of divination is people will get inspiration and they will have a book. They call it, they will journal. They have these streams of writings, endless, you know, the thoughts just come to him and they will just write things. Some of these things are Christian things. They are Christians. They claim to be Christian. They write and they think that it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But it's not. It's divination. And visualization. They teach people to visualize in their mind. And they visualize things to a certain extent where it becomes a reality. It manifests to become a reality in their lives. Then you hear another term called spirit guides. The new age, some of you may have come across the new age people mixed with Christianity and they pray. And they say that when you pray, you will come across figures that comes to your mind. People and uh, like they are not angels, they are just like, they are, they are, they are spirit beings, they are spirit entities that will come to your mind and, and they will visit you. They are just the reflections of your soul. Because your soul has many things accumulated and you need to, need it to process your mind like a computer, you need to process them. There are spirit guides that come to your life to help you in the journey of life. And some of these spirit guides are very friendly, they smile at you. They don't say some things, they don't say words, they just look at you and you and you go into deep meditation, you see light, you see balls of fire, balls of light, you visualize, you have you have demonic beings. These are demonic beings, spirit guides are demonic beings that manifest. People who have unknowingly, even though they may be Christians, and if you engage in new age techniques in prayer any meditation though your intention is to contact god but you end up contacting in the spirit world demonic spirits and false vision uh, there is a new one now called centering prayers they'll teach people to relax and just sit down you close your eyes i'm not sure any, any one of you experienced this you can Google about it. It's all over the internet. Some of them are proposed uh, 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 by Christians, centering prayers. In other words, 
to teach you how to discipline your thoughts that your thoughts won't go all over the place. When you pray, you just think of one word, peace or love. And then you center your prayers, use that word to be your focus. Every time when your mind fluctuates and goes to other places, when you meditate, come back to that word, the sacred word. The sacred word for you, maybe you choose peace, you choose love, you choose a word, uh, unity or harmony like that. So you use that word to be your centering. What are all these? These are techniques to try to pray. These are techniques to try to go deep in prayer. And there are people who practice this faithfully. When they practice it a lot, a lot of the time, they're able to control their mind and discipline their mind. And what happens is they will come to a point where they will contact the spirit world. And they will come to contact with spirit beings and spirit entities. Jesus is not there. Remember, they teach that the power of your mind has the ability to create realities. And you can create and visualize what you want in your life. And so if you can create and visualize what you want in your life, Jesus has no place there. God is not involved there. It is all your mind, a technique, a contemplative method of prayer, meditation with sublimal music. And you do feel peace. You do feel some kind of uh, 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 rest. And more amazingly, they experience some kind of manifestation. The new ages, ask any new ages. They will see the spirit guys and they say, oh, these are harmless. They are just reflection of our soul. So when they meditate for like one hour, they see a man and a woman standing there and just looking at them. Then they pass by, like they travel into space. And they say, these are just the reflection of your soul, not realizing that they are engaged with the spirit world and contact with demons. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not hard to know God. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. Hallelujah. We don't have to go to such deep technique and, and ways to try to reach God. God is a person. His name is Jesus. I shared last Friday a powerful message, I believe. His brother Noel had put it on the WhatsApp group. Please listen to it. Jesus is our shepherd. When we make Jesus our shepherd, when we have divine relationship, we, have, we can enjoy the great 14 blessings in Psalm 23. When the Lord is my shepherd, I make him my shepherd. I don't need all these things and all these manifestations and, and methods and techniques and trying to get to the spirit world. My focus is only one person. His name is Jesus. When I have divine relationship, the book of Psalm 23 says, I have divine protection, I have divine supply, I have divine contentment, I have divine rest, I have divine blessings, I have divine joy, I have divine anointing. It's all found in a person. His name is Jesus. And it's not hard to know God, you see. But people who do not know God, they try these techniques, and they manage to succeed to contact the spirit world. But those spirit beings is not the Holy Spirit. Okay, so anytime when you hear these words that your friends may invite you, your, uh, they may even be Christians or Christian groups of uh, doing, there's no such thing as Christian yoga. There's no such thing as crystal ball uh, energy healing using essential oils. You see, incense is used in the temple, but incense attract demons. Certain smell will bring demons. If you don't believe me, go to any temple, you see they burn incense. Those smell bring demons. Sublimal music, centering prayers, streams of inspired writings, you know, some, some new age, 
some spirit of divination or familiar spirit on somebody they are being inspired they just thoughts just come to them they just write it's a demon that inspired these thoughts many years ago i read an article of a rock music star i would i won't mention his name he's number one in the rock world he says he goes to his cabin when he goes to his cabin he will have marijuana he smoked marijuana he spoke pot he take drugs and he says suddenly there will come an inspiration upon him like something not just the drugs but he felt like a cloak he felt like something came over him like a garment he will grab his piano and then he will compose the notes and he come out with the song that song become the top hit number one hit in the world that will give him millions you sell your soul to the devil the devil can give you money yes subliminal music streams of writings light balls visualization spirit guides uh, focusing on certain words when you pray hey you don't focus or focus on words when you pray you focus on a person his name is jesus there's no other but jesus christ the son of god can you say amen fellowship with god and talking to god and communing with god is not hard it is simple it is simple it's not hard to know god can i hear an amen it's not hard to learn to pray he is a person he's not an object and so these familiar spirits when is contacted or is in a person the spirit of divination can be transferred that is why god is so serious god put to death those familiar spirits those who have familiar spirits in the land when you come into contact with people who have a familiar spirit and you fellowship a lot and you talk a lot you invite them to your home that familiar spirit can be transferred and it comes upon you it doesn't possess you in the beginning if you are a christian but it can follow you it can follow you home when you are always with a person who has familiar spirit you open your life to them you know just like in the in the in the in the christian world the holy spirit can be transferred if you always follow pastor around you follow men of god and we always share things some of the anointing some of the spirit of god will get transferred to your life for example if you always associate with me my seriousness in the bible in teaching the bible will get transferred to you the teaching anointing will be transferred to you you will want to study the bible like the way i study why because there's a transference of spirit the spirit gets transferred and it's good for you you get a good transference when you mix with men of god the spirit of god get transferred they don't have to lay hands on you just being in fellowship and in prayer like in our zoom service we pray the spirit of god is transferred the word of god is transferred so when you are in contact i watch a tv program when uh, there was this group of people who were playing with new uh, they were new ages i'm not sure whether they call themselves new ages they were they were trying the the, the paranormal experience where they have a medium they have a spirit in the center and they will hold hands and then they he will she will pray and she would you know do whatever she they, they are doing and she begin to see things as she pray that thing spread to the rest of the eight people in the table and then they will do a short uh, segment what happened what was the experience they begin to receive the same uh whatever they call it they don't call it anointing you know they're not christians they receive the same familiar spirit familiar spirits are real and they follow people they can follow people around they if you are a christian they may not possess you but they can follow you and give you false vision and false dreams some of the dreams will come true but some of the dreams will not that's how you will know these are familiar spirits if it is god all will come true hallelujah amen you remember the snakes that moses did the snake of moses the serpent 
when, when Moses threw the rod down, it became a serpent as a sign. The rod of Moses, the serpent, swallowed up the serpents of all the other magicians in the land. And so this familiar spirit has the ability to be transferred. Years ago, I was teaching in a cell group before this church started. And there was a sister called Sister Olga. Those of you who know Ramola, if you see Ramola again, you can check out this story with her. Because I was teaching in that group in Romola's house and Sister Romola has a neighbor called Sister Olga. She will cross over to Romola's house. And I was used to be the teacher in the group. That's many years ago. And there was this Sister Olga always comes and tell me, she says, Brother Francis, I always see things. I say, oh, I thought that was good. This was meant to be good. I thought she saw the Lord. I thought she saw angels. And so then she would tell me what she saw, you know. Then she started telling me the weird, weird things that she see almost every day. I think it would become like a torment. I didn't know what to do because at that time I didn't have the knowledge. I only thought you see good things. But she says, you know, I see like children, dead children who I know that they are dead that they are running around the street. Then I see uh, a man standing on the road under the lamppost. Then I see some uh, couples staring at me. I said, oh, they're friendly. They look at me and they smile, and then I pass by. She's able to see all these things in the spirit realm. And on a continual basis, until I didn't know what to, how to answer her and how to explain to her, Finally, I remember I prayed for, I said, Lord, don't let us see all these things anymore. I don't know much about the, her background of her life. Possibly, although she's a believer, she, she worships in our prayer meetings, she prays, she reads the Bible, she loves the Lord. In fact, one time she asked me to pray for the engagement of her daughter who did a simple engagement ceremony in their home. She loves the Lord. But I don't know what happened in her past life or in her life in the past. She must have come into contact with familiar spirits. And familiar spirits has the ability to follow you and produce false vision and dreams in your life. And they can bring harm and defile your spirit. Yes, of course, if you are non-Christian, it can possess you. And, you, and there, there are some people who are not believers. They see things all the time. And these things are not of God. It does not mean that when you see things in the spirit world, it's good. The Bible teaches us about the gifts of the spirit, okay, and visions and dreams. It teaches like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from 7 to verse 11, it says the gifts of the spirit are the manifestation of the spirit. They are the willings of the spirit. He distributes to each one as he wills. A genuine word of knowledge, a genuine vision, you don't see all the time. You only see what the Holy Spirit wants you to see at that point of time. And it's always for a divine purpose. But the spirit of divination is given to satisfy a desire of the flesh for the knowledge of the future. Okay, let me just now give you uh, six points and uh, I hope I, I can help you in this so that you always remember how to differentiate between the spirit of divination or familiar spirit from a genuine word of knowledge. See, when God gives a genuine word of knowledge, okay, it always has a purpose. It has a purpose to heal. It has a purpose to warn. Yes, it has a purpose to bring you into closer holiness. And God is concerned about your security in heaven. He's concerned about your eternal security. It's always the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of divination is a, is, a, is a false word of knowledge that satisfies the flesh for the, the future. 
you want to know about the future. Let me let me give you the first these six differences. It's very subtle. Unless you are discerning and walking in the spirit of God, you cannot discern. You'll be taken by the supernatural revelation of the medium and the familiar spirit. They forecast, they tell you about the grandfather's favorite chair or his favorite meal of fish. And you'll be amazed how this can happen. It's nothing to that. Spirits have knowledge. They, are, they, 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 they watch you all the time. They know about your habits and pattern. Now, spirit of divination, number one, it feeds on man's pride and ego. Sometimes they reveal this knowledge to you, like the new ages, they practice this. They always make them feel good. The spirit of divination feeds man's pride and feeds man's ego. It makes one confident and they are self-assured by their self-effort that what they are doing in life is right. Their pursuit of life is good, you know, and uh, success and uh, uh, this is the way to live your life. So it feeds man's ego and pride. Sometimes it brings fear and unease in people's heart. You know that's not the Holy Spirit. Both are not the Holy Spirit. The word of knowledge never make you feel confident about yourself. The word of knowledge never make you feel uh, self-assured and confident about your future. Yes? And, and this word of knowledge will never help you to feel, give a feeling that uh, you will not fall. That only God, it's only God. You know, last week I was listening to a message by Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn was saying, I don't even trust myself. I don't trust my heart because I don't trust this wicked heart of mine that I will fall. I will not fall. It is God Almighty I must trust. It's Jesus Christ I must trust all the time on my knees that he will keep me from falling. Wow, I thought that was, that was really good. It was just a 20-minute devotion he shared. So the spirit of divination is a different spirit. It comes and makes you feel self-confident, makes you feel proud of yourself, of your achievement, what you're doing is right. Sometimes it brings fear and it causes an unease in your heart. God's spirit is not like that. God's spirit always builds up, but build up in a way that you will have the spirit, have the right spirit. The right spirit will be God. I am nothing, but you are everything. Lord, I must decrease. You must increase. That's the spirit of God. Number three, Spirit of divination will focus on meeting your worldly natural needs. All of us have worldly natural needs and we are more inclined to decide rather than the spiritual, to think about our eternal security, our holiness in God, to please God. We are overwhelmed by our worldly natural concern. Most of us, we are concerned and we have anxiety. We have desires for our children desires for our business, yes, and this world's worldly goods and the issues of life. And spirit of divination will tap into this. He will answer this, he will try to give answers to your, to, 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 to your concern for worldly needs of man. That's the reason why, now you understand, people go to medium, they pay money, yes? They pay great sums of money and go to great effort to Thailand, to somewhere. Why? They are seeking for the world's natural needs of man. Man's needs is always in the natural world. Never about pleasing God. Never about living a holy life. Never about walking in God's commandment. You see, the natural man won't, won't like that. The natural man is only thinking about his desire, his ambition, his plan in this life, the issues of life. So, People go to a temple and go to medium and family spirit for this. And you notice that the word, so-called word of knowledge, uh, this the spirit of divination gives, always minister in this area. Seldom ask you to live a holy life. Seldom ask you to give up sin. If the spirit of God, the spirit of God will cause you to think that greater is he that is in you, that he must increase, I must decrease. 
I am nothing so that he can become everything. Hallelujah. And so it's a different kind of spirit. God wants us to trust him fully and his word. God wants you to do the simple things in life. For example, obey what you already know. God wants you to know that your Christian life needs to be built slowly, little by little. Every day, read your Bible. Every day, have time with God. Obey his word. Do what you already know. If what we already know, we will not do. If what we already know, we will not obey. Say, Pastor, what is that? Well, the Bible tells us what we already know. Seek first the kingdom of God. Love one another. Submit to the elders. Yes. The Bible says, he who has my word and keeps them. It is he who loves me. Honor me with your substance. Let no ungodly conversation comes out of your mouth. See, we know so many things, but if the things that we know, we do not put into practice and we don't obey, it's no point going to seek for a prophetic word, going to seek these powerful so-called ministries that can give you a prophetic word because God will not give you. And if you do receive, it may not be from God. It may be from you. Open yourself to the spirit of divination. The Christian life is lived day by day, moment by moment. Simple obedience, simple submission, doing what you know, day by day, year by year, decade by decade. And God wants us to do everything in our power that we already know. What he has showed us in the word, if we obey and follow. And only when you don't have the knowledge, God sees it fit. He gave you a supernatural dream or vision to give you a helping hand, to confirm and assure you of something. He leads you by faith, not by vision. He leads you by his word, not by vision and dreams. Understand that. Primarily, you may be a Christian that have not had a dream or a vision for 20 years in your life, but you are faithful, you are dedicated. Every day you read your Bible, every day you grow to be more like Christ, every day you pray, every day you believe in. You will experience the growth, the true growth, of a Christian, rather than there are some who will not read his word, who will not put into practice what he knows. They have not sought to devour the scriptures. They hardly know any promises in the Bible. They hardly can know any promises about what is prophecy, yet they want the prophetic word. They are setting themselves up for trouble. And you see this all over the global body of Christ today, especially in Africa, people are just deceived, running to and fro. Have you got a word of the Lord for me? Have you got a word of prophecy for me? If you don't even obey the simple things the Bible has shown to you, God will not speak further. I can assure you, from my walk with God, my knowledge of God, if the simple things in my life I'm talking about, the things that God has shown me, if I will not obey, it, I will not follow. I will not exert effort to follow and search what he has said already. And I want to look to a man. God will not speak. Understand that. I said last Friday, we thank God for great pastors. A great pastor has passed away this month in Korea. We thank God for great pastors and great ministers and great prophets. Yes. But you know why they are great? You don't become a great man of God by running to a great prophet. You don't become a great daughter of God by running to a great prophet. You become a great man of God by running to Jesus, the shepherd. They became great because they make Jesus their shepherd. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And to have Jesus as a shepherd is not hard. Jesus says, come. Oh, come. 
Let me tell you, come. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn of me. Me and my word. If you have not even mastered my word, why do you want to listen to the words of man? If you have not mastered, if you have not mastered the word of God, why do you run here and theater for the word of prophecy? You see, in my life, I never run. No matter great prophets, I will never. Because I say, God, you have spoken many things already. Lord, the things you have spoken, I cannot even fulfill it. The things that you revealed to me, I must do. I have only done a certain percent. There's so much more I need to follow. Why do I want to learn some more? I want to know new things. See, it's the wrong spirit. Yes? So that's number three. The Christian life is not easy. God wants us. It might not be exciting in a sense like mundane, day-to-day, -day, reading the Bible, day-to-day, -day, feeding on his word, day-to-day, -day, praying, day-to-day, -day, drawing close to Jesus. You may think that it's not exciting, but that is the way to grow spiritually. There is no fast track to spiritual growth where you just go and seek out a word from a prophet or some man or some woman. You may end up with the spirit of divination coming into your life and you cannot even discern. Number four, the spirit of divination will make people feel that they are superior. They claim they're always, this is a characteristic of cow. They claim to have special revelation. They claim to have special closeness to God. And, you know, they claim to, if any church claim that we have a revelation, other churches will know that church is in delusion. Jesus is no respecter of person. There's no such thing as a higher class of Christians. Yes? And so they are deceived. And sometimes now in the body of Christ, people experience powerful, so-called powerful revelation like gold dust, manifestation of feathers. It gives me the airy feeling where you manifest feathers. My God, that is in witchcraft. One big pastor in America said, every time I preach, there's a feather falling down. You know? And they see balls of light. They hear voices of angels. And my healing angel tells me now to heal the sick. Angels never heal the sick. What does the Bible say? The Bible says the Holy Spirit heals the sick. He gives us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. After, after Calvary, it is the Holy Spirit. And so they worship angels. They, um, um, they, they, they go to these uh, manifestations that are highly dangerous. That is part of them are the new age. Okay. And so when you, when you grow as a Christian, the word of knowledge is real. I have experienced and operate in the word of knowledge, a few occasions, the word of wisdom and the gifts of healing. And the spirit that is inside of this is it always humbles you. It always causes you to, to know that, Lord, I am nothing. I am nothing, Lord, that you can be everything. Lord, it's got nothing to do with me. It is your manifestation. We talk about having the right motivation for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And with this, I will close. I've shared with you how in Acts chapter 8, read about the story of Simon. Where Apostle Peter says, your heart is not right. He told Simon, your heart is not right. When we seek for the gifts of the Spirit, as we teach this series, we must have the right heart. Hallelujah. We must have a right heart and a right spirit. And we must not have bitterness because Peter says, I, I perceive that you are bound by bitterness and iniquity. And so if someone who is not on their own, personally devoted to God in prayer and seeking, reading the word and being faithful in his own church, listening to the preaching from the pulpit. But if you run hither and thither, you are out of balance, out of sequence. It's only when you do what you know you must do. Hallelujah. Be faithful in the little that God has shown you. Practice it. Obey. Do it. Glory to God.
No, now sometimes when I look at the Bible, I say, God, there's so much you have spoken. I've done too little. There's so much I know, but so much, Lord, there's so much more I need to put into practice. I have no more time to look for other new revelation. The revelation, Lord, you have given me, there's so much, Lord, I have not yet even practiced it in my life. You see, I don't know whether you catch what I'm trying to say. So much, Lord, I have known, but I have not, not put fully into practice. Love ye one another. Pray for one another. I say, Lord, I've not even done this fully. I've not managed to pray every day for all the people in the church. Pray by name. Let your light so shine before men that others may see your good works. I say, God, there's just not enough good works I've done. And all that I know in the scriptures are so many and so full and so rich. Lord, it would take that 10 lifetime to leave it. To leave all that the Bible has shown me. Glory to God. So God, let me leave it first. Let me leave what? Let me lift out what I already know. Be a good wife. Submit to your husband. You know that. Be a good husband. Love your wives. Oh, yo, love your wife as Christ loved the church. As Christ loved the church, Christ died for the church. So, Lord, you want me to die for my wife? So, Lord, I've not lived that yet. All that God has spoken, the Bible says, He has spoken to the prophets of old. And in the last days, he has spoken through his son, Jesus, in the book of Hebrews. All that God wants to speak to your life, he has spoken through the prophets. What are the prophets? Isaiah, have you read it? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, Amos, Haggai. God has spoken through his prophets. You have not even opened to that book. But you will run to a prophet for prophecy. See, that is not all of us, but there is some percentage in the whole body of Christ. There are always people like that, deceived to think that there is a shortcut. There is a fast track to spiritual growth. I'm here to tell you this morning, there is no fast track to spiritual growth. There is no fast track to spiritual growth, but we need to get a hold of God's word, read God's word, read the prophets. I mean, when you read the prophets of Haggai, of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel, and all these prophets of old, you will be so filled with that revelation. You say, God, I don't even have time to put into practice in my life. Hallelujah. So first thing first, but you say, Pastor, does that mean that you don't believe in prophets? Does that mean you don't believe in prophecy? No, I'm not saying that. If not, we will not invite prophets into our church. We will not invite prophets like Summer Church into our church. Okay. But we say that first thing first. First thing, you must not take the easy way out. You must not take the fast track to get a word from the Lord, get an answer. Like even Saul was willing to get an answer. And he ended up with the spirit of divination and accelerated his death and bring harm to his life. First thing first, sought God, seek God with all of your heart. The answer is always found in the word. And when God sees fit that he wants to give you something more, something that for some reason in his will, he gives you a prophetic word. He gives you a vision. He gives you a dream. Hallelujah. But the word is the platform. The word is the railway track. The train must run. If you don't have the railway track, you try to run the train, what will happen? The railway track will, the train will crash because you have not laid the railway track. Remember I showed you the story of a toy train. When I was young, I remember we used to play those toy trains. We will fix up the railway track first. And then we'll put the choo-choo train and the battery on the railway track. Then we press the button, then the, the train will run. 
But somehow, if we didn't fix the railway track properly, that train will stop. So your life will come to an head end. Your, your life will come to a set end when you don't build the railroad tracks properly. The railroad tracks are the word of God. It's the full word of God. The scripture says God has already spoken through his prophets. Have you read the words of the prophets first before you seek to hear the prophecy of a man? Do you have more confidence in the prophecy of a man whom you have no knowledge of, of prophecy of a woman whom you have no knowledge of, of their life, their background, how they live, more than your confidence in the word of God? It's the word of God that gives you the railroad, the railroad track. Hallelujah. The word of God must be the safety net. The safety net that we can always bounce. You know, the, what do you call it? The gymnasts. Uh, those who do, you see in the circus, they will jump high. They do the trapezine and then they will fall off. They'll do, they'll do uh, swings up in the air gymnasts in the air, and then they will fall. But at the base, there's always a safety net so that they won't crash. Without the safety net, it's highly dangerous. They can die. And so the word of God is our safety net that we must always base. This morning, I've given you the safety net to discern, to differentiate the word of knowledge that is from God and familiar spirits. Familiar spirits appeal to your senses and your ego. Familiar spirits appeal to answer your anxiety of life. They focus on the worldly, natural needs of man, like their ambition, like their anxiety for their children, their business, their, the issues of life. But amazingly, you find that the Spirit of God is concerned about your soul, the spirit of God is concerned about your eternal destiny. And that's why a lot of people don't like to, you know, they, they are more inclined to wanting to know, to meet their worldly needs in this world. And that's why you find hosts of people going to temple to seek for answers. And without realizing Christians are so overwhelmed by the issues of life and their anxiety. And it can cause them to seek from the wrong source. Always remember, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit and the spirit of divination. That's, that's the key there I wanted to share with you. And the spirit of God will always draw us to holiness. The spirit of God will always draw us to one thing. I believe this, I will close. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. If something causes you, some prayer group or some church or some ministry teaches you a formula, uh, a way to meditate, a way to pray, you know, uh, 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 a formula, a word to memorize, a, a deep breathing on, and focusing on the light. Now, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. They, they have not emphasized, if it is the true spirit of God in a message, it will always draw us to the preeminence of Christ. Christ must be exalted. The person not just his teaching you know the new age teach about love too the new ages they take from the bible too they teach about love they teach about peace they teach about harmony they teach that we are the brotherhood of man you know we are the new world the new world order it sounds very good biblical but what is missing what is missing in this ministry some of these ministries do they focus on the person of Christ? The Lord is mine. The Lord is. He didn't say the Lord was. The Lord is. Is current. My relationship with Jesus is current. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is. Is continuous. It's not has been. Psalm 23 didn't say the Lord has been my shepherd. Or the Lord will be my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Any ministry that exalts the preeminence of Christ, it encourages you to focus on the person of Christ, not just his teaching. 
new ages can teach on peace, on love, on harmony, on loving the poor. And you will be deceived thinking, oh, that's Christian, that's good, that's Bible. Of course, they have to come in sheep's wolf's clothing. Jesus taught us, let me, let me share this. There are two things false teachers and false prophets will, will wear, sheep's clothing. There are ravenous wolves with sheep's clothing. What are the sheep's clothing? The Bible, the teaching, and the songs. Looks like they're teaching the Bible. Looks like they're singing the same songs. I was in Philippines one day. There was a guy called Kubaloy. He now claimed himself to be the son of God. Massive church. Kubaloy in Davao. He claimed that Jesus will come to Davao. When I on the television, he got a massive choir, all dressed in white. Massive congregation. He pictures from the Bible. The first time I heard him, I was in my hotel room resting. And they sing the same songs that we sing. I said, wow, this is good service, man. It's, it's, it's good for, you know, I'm all alone in the room. Let me just listen to this, some of these songs. The same songs we sing. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. You know, my favorite song. Then later when I met Pastor Flores, I said, well, who is this guy, Kubaloy? Then he said, oh, he's a false prophet. Huh? So why is he a false prophet? He claimed to be the son of God. Oh, then I listened some more, some more. He doesn't say exactly I'm the son of God. He called himself the second son. Not the son of God, but the second son. The chosen son, yeah. He's the chosen son. Capital S. Sheep, wolves in sheep's clothing, the two things that they do, they teach the Bible, some parts of the Bible, they sing the same songs. That's why you identify them with us. But their lives and motivation and their spirit is a different spirit. They are not concerned for your soul that you make it to heaven. They're not concerned that you live a devoted life. They're not concerned that you give your heart to the master. They don't teach things like take up the cross. They don't teach things like I must decrease, he must increase. But they will attend to give you words of prophecy, to encourage you to meet your worldly needs. Okay? And sometimes they are supernatural. Because why? There is a spirit involved. It's the spirit of divination. They are familiar spirits. They can know the favorite dish of your mom, your mom's favorite dish. Her main concern when she was in this life, she was concerned about your younger brother. Ah, the medium will come and tell, and they will ask questions about your younger brother. And you'll be amazed how this spirit is, and this, this familiar spirit knows. You have never met this medium. You see, it's not the medium, it's the spirit in the medium. But today, these spirits, are no longer in the temple. I want you to know these spirits are no longer in the temple because Christians don't go there. They no longer attract us there because we know that's wrong. That's the wrong place. They have now come into the church. They have now come through a new package in false ministry, especially in Africa, just on the television that you watch some of these prophecies. Amazingly accurate. But many of these prophecies they give is about the personal detail of the person's life. You don't see it in the Bible. The prophecies that the prophets gave in the Bible is always about the kingdom. It's always about the ministry. Very little about the personal detail of your life. It has become like fortune telling. It's Christian fortune telling. It's the spirit of divination. It does nothing to help you to grow holy. It does nothing to help you to fear God. It does nothing really to transform your life to be like Jesus. So there you have it. I've covered the spirit of uh, familiarity. I trust that you will remember this as a guideline uh, in distinguishing them from the word of knowledge. The spirit is different. The purpose is different. Uh, you, you, if you are not sensitive and walking close to the Lord and have the word, you cannot discern. It's like, you know, you drink a drink. 
How many of you know root beer? In A and W, you have root beer. And you drink root beer and you drink sassy. You realize there is a difference. Uh, but if you're not a regular drinker, you don't know. Or you drink Pepsi and you drink Coca-Cola. There is a difference in the taste. So root beer and sassy, you know, they, 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 don't, they taste the same. But if you take one cup of sassy and root beer, it's, it's slightly different. And so God wants us to be discerning. The only way is to have the true spirit of God, to have the Holy Spirit strong in your life. How to have the Holy Spirit strong in your life? Pastor, there's no shortcut. You have to day by day, year by year, decade upon decade, feeding on his word, growing, master his word. First thing first, master his word before you hear the words of man. Hallelujah. I, want, I hope I have inspired you from the teaching ministry here in Manor House to want to study God's word, to thoroughly study God's word, to master it so no one can deceive you. In Jesus' name, let us pray. Lift your hands to God today. Oh, wonderful Jesus, wonderful master. Lord, we thank you. You are maturing us, your church. We thank you, God, you are helping us to grow into your image and your character. And we pray, God, we pray, Father, this is from our heart, that we will truly want to be devoted student of your word. That, Lord, that we will not choose the easy way, we will not choose the simple way, but we will choose the way you have set for us. The day by day, Lord, we will obey what we already know. We must put into practice what you already show us. The Lord, that we will know the words of the prophets as revealed in the Bible. We will know because in the words of the prophets, we see your heart. We see your revelation. You have already spoken. And in the last days, you have spoken to Jesus, your son, his teaching, his words of admonishment. God, we pray for this that our hearts will be filled with it, will be so saturated with it, that the word of God will dwell richly in our hearts, always. Wonderful Jesus, we thank you today that as you bring this understanding to us, we pray for your protection. We pray, God, that you protect us from all that is not from you. And God, protect us from every impure doctrine, every false teaching, every doctrine of devils, every spirit of the new age, every spirit of divination. In the name above every name, the name of Jesus, I take authority, I break it, I bind it. I pray for your precious blood over every believer this year and in all the years to come before we see you face to face. Protect us, your people, from the spirit of divination. Protect us from evil spirits of deception. Keep your church, this church, I pray for Manor House, free from false prophets, false teachers, and false prophecy. False dreams and false vision. I cancel them in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you. You are strong and powerful. You are great. You rise up, Lord. You rise up inside of us. And you defend your church and you build your church that the gates of hell shall not prevail. Hallelujah. Father, we pray that we will be strong in the spirit of truth. We will be strong in the truth of your doctrine. That, Lord, that your people will have discernment and wisdom. Lord, as we live in this world, there are wolves everywhere. There are wolves in sheep's clothing, even in the body of Christ. So, Father, I pray. I pray for wisdom. I pray for discernment. I pray, God, for myself, that you keep me from deception. You keep me walking humbly in your truth. That, Lord, I will not be deceived by false pastors and false apostles, for they are already in existence, even in the book of Revelation. 
So I pray for Manor House, that Lord, that you will keep Manor House pure in doctrine, pure in spirit, pure in love. The Lord, that we will endeavor to do what we must do, already know you have taught us. The little things we will not despise, that we will love one another, we will pray for one another, we will keep the unity of the spirit, and Lord, that we will be one as you are one with the Father. God, keep all of us safe in your mighty hand. In Jesus' wonderful name, I ask and I pray. Amen.